Welcome back to the uh, course on uh, Microsoft Blockchain as a Service. And uh, we're going to progress through. This is Module 2. And in this module, we're going to talk about smart contracts. We call it Smart Contracts Explained. And really, what we're going to talk about here are some of the internals of what makes up a smart contract and how does this thing actually function in the blockchain. Which is good because I get a little bit of it. But as we go into this, uh, I'm going to pepper you with some questions because even I'm still trying to put my head around some of these things. So it's, it's good that uh, we've got you here to help go through these items. So let's dive in. Sure. Okay, so from a core concept perspective, uh, we're talking about what is a smart contract. And uh, a couple things make it up here. I've kind of put out on the slide here. The first being it's a signed code, so we're establishing a clear owner. As we mentioned before, this is immutable and persistent. Meaning that once we sign this thing, and once we put that as a transaction on the blockchain, it'll live there forever. And it can't be deleted, it can't be pulled back out. How do you, like what happens if you have this smart contract thing that you decide you no longer want, or you were just playing around and it's there? That's a, that's a great question, Derek. So one of the things that comes up is, what do I do in this exact case? Like I said, I put something up there and actually I want to make a change to it. We can't change it, right, because it's immutable. So you have um, to be perfect the first time. So yeah, you just have to be perfect oh, nice. and everything will be fine. Okay. Uh, no. So actually what you want to do is when you publish these things, there's a couple different things to think about and we'll walk through some of these as we get into the more of the development and design okay. sessions. But decoupling some of the logic inside of your smart contract to make it more modular, that's going to help you because then you can just replace pieces of it. Okay. And, and that'll help solve that problem. But again, still, we're putting something new on the blockchain. So if we put a new piece of code, um, that thing's going to be new, and we have to migrate that old application and state everything that was in that smart contract we're now going to have to migrate. And I have to write all of this in assembly, right, or binary? Uh, you don't have to write in binary. We have different language, high-level languages right now. Okay. Um, so the most popular one being Solidity, okay. which is a JavaScript-type uh, language. So it looks very much, if people are familiar with ES, ES6 or any of the JavaScript okay. frameworks, um, it looks very similar to that. Um, it has some tweaks, obviously, for the language itself in order to do that. But the idea being, um, when we do have to replace those things, we have to migrate the data. It has state and code, right? And if we can decouple the state from the smart contract, that's one thing that we can do that can help us out a lot. So now when we migrate our code, we're just talking about the logic itself, not and the state. And when you talk about state, you're also talking about the data that it may, uh, that it may be inside that contract. Totally right. So yeah, when we talk about state, uh, it's a good point. That's really like the data that we're talking about that we actually have stored up there in the blockchain. So in the previous module, we talked a lot about how you have these hashes, you have these blocks. Uh, how do these things execute? Where do these things go when you push them to the blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain? What happens then? Sure. So what, the way this functions and the primary platform for smart contracts right now is, is Ethereum. Um, so if we talked about Ethereum, essentially uh, there's an, uh, what's called an EVM or an Ethereum virtual machine that's actually going to run that code for us. So once we've published our contract, it doesn't execute it per se. It's just now put it on the blockchain and now it's there, just like a service for us to call. Um, so when someone comes along and says, yeah, I actually want to execute some code on that, they're going to create whatever parameters, so state, they're going to give right. us like some parameters and say, I want to call this method on this smart contract up there. It's going to get passed into a transaction. Whenever that block gets mined, when it says, okay, now we got to do that block, that's when the Ethereum VM is going to be spring into action and say, oh, wait, you got a smart contract you need to execute, I'll do that for you. So it can take some time between the point where I put my request in before that block gets mined and then this thing executes. But it's also important to note that when we talk about the Ethereum virtual machine, it's not like an Ubuntu VM spinning up behind the scenes. This is just part of the Ethereum code base uh, that when the miner uh, starts doing the work on that block, uh, that those parameters get executed against the logic inside that smart contract and then something happens? Correct. So you can think about it just like .NET, it's bytecode, right? So we, when we compile it, we're, not, we're compiling to almost like MSIL, right? We're compiling to this intermediate language, and then the EVM is going to actually run it in, in, in machine code, right? It's going to run itself up there, the opcodes. And just like if I were sending a transaction or some money between us, I guess you got to pay for that somehow. How Correct. do you do that? Correct. So one thing to hit before we get into the gas discussion is basically uh, I wanted to make clear that when these things actually execute, it executes on every node. Oh, um, no, so hold on. Move through that slide. Say that one more time. <laughs> yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, there's a delay, right? There's going to be some lag between the time someone submits a transaction and says, I want to call this thing. Right. It's going to be totally asynchronous because it's going to get submitted at some point. We've got to mine that block. When we mine that block, everybody executes this because I can't have Derek 
Derek spins up a node, and let's say he, he has an EVM running there, right? So whenever the code it says, hey, we need to run this method, and here's the parameters, Derek's node will run that, and my node will also run it as well. And then we're going to compare answers and go, here's what I got, what'd you get? Okay, and then when you compare those answers, you assume that they'll all be the same, and that's what secures uh, that contract because you've changed the state, potentially. You are uh, setting new state, you're setting new transactions, you may be sending Ether around, uh, but uh, I assume then that in Ethereum, blocks have to be mined much, much faster than, say, for example, like Bitcoin, where you may have a block every 10 minutes or so. Yeah, and that's usually, that's the model for Bitcoin. As you mentioned, it's a 10-minute block cycle, so that's what they're kind of, there's different kind of knobs and dials they can kind of tweak from a difficulty perspective inside their system in order right. to facilitate that and make sure they stay within that 10 minutes. Um, the other thing is, like you mentioned, uh, with Ethereum, it's slightly different, so it's much faster. They're usually around 10 to 15 second block times. Oh, okay. Uh, much faster. Great. Um, and obviously, the smaller the network, actually, the faster it is, right, you can imagine, because we're going to have consensus build faster. But the downside to having a smaller network is... Security. Security, because right. if you have uh, too, many, too few nodes securing that blockchain in a totally trustless model, then bad actors or just bad code uh, can impact the stability of that blockchain very, very quickly. Uh, and so that's uh, some of the trade-offs that you want to. But, but back on this... How do you pay for having your sure. contract ex executed? Sure. So what's going to happen here, um, and if you look at this slide that I have up here right now, this is another core concept, gas, you need it. Um, so we have this concept of what's called gas inside um, Ethereum that basically says, okay, in order for me to execute, what's going to happen is the EVM is going to look at that bytecode. It's going to look at, like, what are you trying to call here? And it's going to be able to calculate, based on the opcodes inside of that, low-level code. It's going to be able to say, Derek just requested something that is very heavy compute. Like, it has to do all these different opcodes, all this different stuff up here, and each one of those opcodes is assigned what's called a gas value, or, like, you can think of it as a cost. Like, it's going to cost you this much to do this opcode. So it's going to calculate that for the entire smart contract and say, here's what he's trying to call. I need this much virtual currency in order to execute this thing. Okay, and so this gas virtual uh, currency has to be spent every time you call your smart contract or execute a function on that smart contract. That's correct. And who pays for that? Whoever's calling the function is actually the one that's going to end up having to pay for that. So this is really cool. I can create this great business on Ethereum, and I can deploy my smart contract, and then it's up to other people that want to use my business to actually pay for it to run. Correct. Okay, that's weird. Yeah, so the cool thing about it is what Derek had mentioned was, like, you know, it's really cool that we can basically build a model and have it kind of scale out, so we're actually paying for some of that network because we uh, right. have gas that's involved here. But also, it's, it's a good kind of denial of service attack kind of, because it costs Guard, money right? to execute it, you want to prevent people from just executing it millions of times and bogging down the entire network. You could imagine if somebody says, wow, you got this really cool network out here, let me just slam it with tons of requests, a denial of service attack. Right. And if they don't have enough gas to do that, they'll eventually run out of gas and then they can't do it anymore. So it's a great kind of fail safe hmm. there. All right, cool. What other kinds of concepts do we have to worry about when we're dealing with uh, these types of smart contracts? Yeah, so with smart contracts, one of the first things you're going to run into is there's different types of accounts um, that are established up there in Ethereum. Um, so when you're looking at, at, at Ethereum itself, there's actually two types of accounts. There's external accounts and contract accounts. Now, we've been talking a lot about smart contracts, and that's really what a contract account is about. If you think about what does that mean, it means, well, there's code there that exists on the blockchain, you know, that, that establishes what this smart contract is, and there's also an account where this this gas can power up, you right. know, other things we can use for that. So that's an account that can actually store Ether, so a state kind of thing you can think of there. From an external perspective, that's how humans interact with it. It could be devices as well, but primarily that's where we come in and we say, hey, we want to actually create a user account, you okay. know, to use this system. We have a key pair. We actually want to, like, match that up with a external account that's actually established on the blockchain, and that's how we can start to interact and kind of have our state. You know, if I'm working in the public space, that's where my Ether is. If right. I'm buying and selling Ether, that's where those transactions are going to be uh, coming across. It. And it's important to note that there's a very subtle difference between contract accounts and people accounts or uh, uh, external accounts. Uh, the external accounts are the ones that are going to hold Ether, but they don't hold code. You have a, a contract account, and that's what actually holds the byte code that executes whenever that address is called within that function. Yeah, and it's an important thing. We'll touch on this when we talk about some of the uh, off-chain components. But 
one of the things that might come to your mind right away is, well, if I compile code and let's say I write a really cool function and I put it up there on the blockchain, it's available for anybody, right? right? It's bytecode up there. Somebody could decompile that and steal my logic. That doesn't sound good. Yeah. So that's so one thing to that's one thing to consider as we go through this, and we have some kind of workarounds with off chain in order to kind of help protect against that. So it's important to note that anytime you take uh, you know my my brilliant business that I'm going to put out onto the blockchain, anytime you take that code and you stick it out there, uh, it's just bytecode, and somebody can disassemble that, and there's your logic. Uh, so it's like the ultimate open source repository. What other kinds of things do we have to worry about? I think balances and uh, we've also the immutability, which we I, I was kvetching about in the last module. But now you're, we're going to talk about some options. So it's out there forever, but there are some ways that we can control it. Yeah. So we have this module this way. Derek had mentioned early on in here about uh, what happens if I put something up there. Maybe it's total garbage. Maybe I was just testing something, or maybe I put something up there and I actually want to get rid of it. So we could migrate the state to a new smart contract, point our DAP or a decentralized app at that new smart contract, and everybody's happy, right? Um, but the old one still exists out there. So how can we basically put that in a state where it can't be called anymore, or it still exists out there, and we still have transaction history, but I don't want people actually interacting with right, it. Right, I want them to use my 2.0 or my 3.0. Yes, yeah, so we have the concept of what's called suicide inside uh, Ethereum. So we can basically allow the contract to kind of self-destruct, okay. essentially. And what we have to do there is basically take that account balance, whatever's up there in the contract, we have to get that out of there because we can't have that sitting in there. And basically then we'll make the code uncallable, essentially. Um, so everything still exists out there, the transaction history from all of time, ever since anybody's ever interacted with that smart contract, it will still be there on that blockchain. And people can actually go look at all that history and everything, but if they try to transact against it in a new one, uh, they'll get an error response back saying okay. you can't call that one. So. So I assume as I've got my, my brilliant idea that I've put together on my whiteboard and I want to develop this thing, uh, it's probably a good idea for me to know that there are some additional limitations that uh, are going to be relevant to our, our smart contract. So uh, what are some of those limitations that we need to talk about? Yeah, so I put a couple of these on the slide here to kind of get you guys, your heads thinking around this kind of thing. But you can think about it, it has to be deterministic. When we do things with a smart contract, we have to do them in such a way that they can be repeatable. because obviously. As we were going through this, you know that um, it's going to execute on multiple VMs at the same time right. or slightly the same time. It's not going to be the exact same time. Um, so making calls external, calling an external web service is a no-no. So what? Time out. So what you're saying is that <coughs> my smart contract that I've put all this work into is isolated within the blockchain itself. It can't call out to get like a, a stock price or anything like that. That's totally correct. So in that model, basically, we can't have this thing making calls out to a web service because you can think about it. Let's say we had 10,000 nodes on our network, or even 1,000 nodes or 100 nodes. They would all end up calling. They that. would all call a web service, but it's going to be slightly different times. What happens if the web service returns something different for this node than this node? Then we don't have a good outcome. Yeah, because my stock price is going to change all of the time, and you have nodes from all over the world. So I can see why that's important, but from a developer standpoint, you're going to need to be very, very careful about how you architect your app because it's going to execute on all the nodes from what you're saying and I can't call external services because I might get a different answer each time it gets called and it's all asynchronous. Yeah, and I think that the other thing to kind of hit on with Solidity specifically is these languages are relatively young, these high level languages that we're talking about. So there's still ways to get yourself in trouble there, right? So it's a, it's a good thing and there's a lot of focus on this right now around this technology called formal verification. And being able to mathematically determine whether you know the code that you wrote is sound, okay. um, but also making sure that there's no bugs in the code because it's software, right? And there's going to be bugs in there, right? So. And in a lot of cases, when you're talking about these types of applications, at least out on the public blockchain, we're dealing with actual human dollars and 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 other uh, currencies. And so, if your smart contract is not developed properly, uh, it can be uh, fairly financially risky. Uh, because your smart contract could get hacked and all of the money that is being stored as part of the state could be uh, uh, transitioned off. So there's a lot of tooling there, but there's a lot of formal verification that needs to go into play there, um, and it can be costly. I think the thing to think about there, though, is you do have the real-time auditing functions. And we do have a lot of different constructs inside the smart contract. 
to kind of control the rate at which things can happen. Okay. Um, so those are kind of nice little gating points in there. And you, again, things to think about as you do development, and we'll talk more in the development session about this, but these are key concepts to really think about when you're doing it. Um, you know, making sure like you're guarding against these kind of bugs, looking at what the community, community has already developed in this space. Right? We don't want to reinvent the wheel. Right. We want to do the same functions that somebody else is doing. We can basically have things that have been vetted out there. So now that we've totally scared you uh, with how, how not to develop a smart contract, we're going to take a little break here and come back and we'll talk about some of the different use cases of where it would be a great idea to use something like a smart contract out on a blockchain. Until next time, we'll see you in a bit. Thanks.